And you'll need to bring the uh, keyboard up so that we can move slides along because we want to be fancy like that. Um, okay, well, I'm so, uh, so glad that everybody is back here this week. I hope you guys had a good week off last Thursday. We had a, a great evening, a uh, great uh, weekend. We went to some private property, got uh, away from the world, no cell phone signal, just a few days of resting, relaxing, all that good stuff. Um, I just wanted to quickly let everybody know, uh, I did create a hidden page on our website. So if you go to centerpointcf.com and you go to slash revelation dash study, then you will get to all of the PDFs. So you'll have all of the notes that um, have been up on the screens. And there's also a link to our uh, playlist for the revelation study on our YouTube channel that nobody can ever find. <laughs> we, we know it's an issue. <laughs> there, there are a lot of center point churches in this country, let me tell you. Um, okay, well, uh, Chris, you want to open us in prayer? Did I unmute me? Oh, good, I did. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> uh, dear <laughs> Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, we just ask that you come and fill this space with your spirit, that you open up our hearts, and that you ready us to be able to receive the truth of your word, and that uh, you would be further revealed and glorified in the study of, of uh, your word as we get together in order to pour through every verse of Revelation, where we just pray for understanding, we pray for your mysteries to be uh, revealed and made clear to us, and most of all, Lord, we pray for those who so desperately need to know you. We lift all this up in the name of your holy, precious Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, welcome back. Um, we are in week six, and we are about to explore chapters 10 and 11. We just left chapters 8 and 9 behind. You want to go to the next slide, honey? Okay, so we are currently in the final events that lead to Christ's rule and reign. So I know we talked about it before, um, and I really wanted to recognize and say again that I know these visions can feel like they're scary. One of the best things that I've heard about this study, about our time together, is it makes it less scary. Um, it's easier to understand, easier to digest, um, and doesn't leave you with that feeling of absolute dread. Um, I'm so glad that people are digging into the book of Revelation instead of avoiding the book of Revelation, which I know is really, really common. But I really wanted you to notice something about tonight's two chapters that we're going to go through. So um, amongst all the things that can feel scary or can feel icky, um, you're also going to see included in this a vision of a glorious angel uh, that claims the whole earth for God. So it's really important that you understand that there's both pieces to this. Not only is there righteous justice and judgment, but there is also beautiful vision um, and an angel coming to, to really uh, bring, bring about the next phase that leads to Christ's return. So in these visions, you're seeing the juxtaposition, the, the juxtaposition of extravagant worship that's happening in heaven, and at the same time, there are great disasters that are happening on the earth. And it can really feel um, disjointed almost. Uh, and it's really important that we understand God's justice and understand his righteousness, because that's what actually helps us to worship him. As we're reading this and we worship him not only um, during the good times, but we also need to worship him during the bad times in the midst of crises, in the midst of what we don't understand or don't have the answers to. There are some things that God always is. He is always good. He is always faithful. He is always comforting. Um, so even if or even when you're in the middle of a crisis or you're facing a tough life situation because all of us have them, I would encourage you to remember those three things. God is good, he is faithful, he is comforting, and you can praise him for those even in the midst of the hardest trials of this life. Okay, you ready? So before we move on, um, we've addressed this in previous weeks. Um, I think... Uh, 
Um, you know, Denise brought it up with a really good question uh, when we last met two weeks ago, is are we going to be seeing what's going on on, on Earth? Are we going to be witnessing these terrible, awful, um, disturbing things that, we're, that are happening in the tribulation on, on Earth? And um, what that really puts in focus is, like Heather said, this juxtaposition of un unprecedented numbers of people from groups that you wouldn't expect are coming to saving faith. God is, is working evangelism. He is working in, in, in gathering as many to himself as possible, which is glorious and wonderful. But at the same time, there's judgment and previews of what's going to happen in hell, which is awful. And we talked about both of those things going on and that, it, and that it's difficult to, to stomach it. I chose that word very carefully because the Bible actually acknowledges this and we are going to see that. Yep. And so we talked about it previously, but it's such an important concept that it's addressed directly in the, in the next book in Revelation that we're going to dig into. And so that, that whole, you know, God is good and God is righteous. And that's a two-edged sword. And I'm choosing that word very carefully as well because that is how uh, the weapon of God is described. It is a two-edged sword that comes from his mouth, right? That there's, there's, there's a way that it cuts that we appreciate and there's a way that it cuts that can be a little hard, hard to take, okay? And then um, the last part before we move on is to keep in mind this is one of the hard, hard, difficult apologetic problems that Christians face in the world today that is rejecting God is that much of the world who rejects God, it's because they no longer believe he's good. And, and we've said that before. So how can a good and just God allow X in the world? And it's because the values of the world and the values of society and the values of people have been have gone in and replaced godly values. And so it's, it's natural and it seems right to people to reject God because they don't see his values. And, and really when you dig in and study it and see it, God's values are ultimately right. And people have the wrong perspective. So it's a, it's a huge apologetic problem, and um, it's difficult to understand, partly because it's apocalyptic in, in Revelation, but it, it's important to understand. It's important that we see it, and so it's going to be one of the things that we highlight tonight. Okay, let's dig in. We're going to read uh, chapter 10, verses 1 through 7. And it says, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, surrounded by a cloud with a rainbow over his head. His face shone like the sun, and his feet were like pillars of fire. And in his hand was a small scroll, other versions will say a little book, that had been opened. He stood with his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and he gave a great shout like the roar of a lion. And when he shouted... The seven thunders answered. When the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, keep secret what the seven th sun thunders said and do not write it down. Then the angel I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand toward heaven. He swore an oath in the name of, of the one who lives forever and ever and who created the heavens and everything in them, the earth and everything in it, and the sea and everything in it. He said, there will be no more delay. When the seventh angel blows his trumpet, God's mysterious plan will be fulfilled. It will happen just as he announced it to his servants, the prophets. Okay, so let's start to dig into this. John is now calling attention to this new movement that he is seeing. Now, there's a messenger that came from God bearing a small scroll or what other versions, uh, translations call a little book. 
Now, some uh, believe that this angel that came down is Christ because his appearance is reminiscent of the Son of Man from Deuteronomy 7. But the original Greek language um, makes it pretty clear that that's not the case uh, because it's unlikely, first, that Jesus would descend to the earth uh, before his true second coming, but the wording of the passage from the original Greek implies that another angel, another of that kind, and another of that kind is, is akin to the angel in Revelation 9.1. There's also debate <laughs> about what the small scroll uh, or the little book refers to. But because the angel seems to claim the earth by putting his feet on the land and on the sea, um, it suggests that this is the deed to the earth. What this is doing is symbolically saying that even though Satan has had control over the earth, it has been a temporary control. God is sovereign in his authority, and he will have victory. So going back to that debate about the identity of this angel, people get wrapped up in Revelation trying to figure out the identities. You know, who are, who are the 144,000 who are... Who's the Antichrist? Who are the prophets? And, and it, it, it is worthwhile to explore it and to try to understand it, but it's also important to not get wrapped around the axle. You know, the, um, the, the, the visions um, that, that John describes uh, where he sees Christ at the beginning of Revelation, that's the other reason that people suspect that this may be a embodiment of Jesus is because those same concepts, the burnished fr bronze legs, um, the white hair, um, uh, the rainbow, the, the, right. rainbow um, the mighty voice like a lion. I mean, the, the, the same um, characteristics that were used to identify Christ when he's speaking directly to John, they're paralleled here. So is this Christ? You know, it, that, that's why people argue for it. Um, and ultimately, I would say, you know, it's interesting, but, you know, the the, the take-home, the important part, is these are traits that show that this is a messenger from God, right? That these are godly characteristics. Rainbow, Noah's Ark, you know, why did God include the rainbow? It, it says that even in this incredible judgment, right, which people would be like, ah, oh, it's as bad as the flood. You know, God goes, well, I promised you we wouldn't do that again. Okay? And, that, and the rainbow is really bringing back the, the no, Noahic covenant. No, yes, the covenant of Noah. Um, and so, it, you know, is this Jesus? You know, we, we read in there that this, this, this being takes an oath in the name of he who created everything. Well, we know that that's Jesus. So what's the likelihood that this angel is speaking in the third person about himself because it's Jesus? It, it, just, <laughs> it doesn't make sense, right? So there's things, there's things that argue for it and there's things that argue against it. Ultimately, this is a being who is acting on behalf of and um, uh, establishing and enforcing God's authority and sovereignty over the earth, right? And, and the fact that he's putting his foot on the land and his foot on the sea and holding the scroll, it's probably the scroll that was just opened, and that is the, he's, he's you know, setting foot on and claiming those things that were previously under Satan's domain, and, and this is um, extending God's authority righteous authority that, that was temporarily removed from the world and reestablishing it. Okay, so now John wants to share what the thundering voices have said, but he's commanded not to. He's supposed to keep it secret, and he's supposed to keep it to himself. Now, this secret revelation, it may have been another series of judgments or some other aspect of prophecy that God is choosing to keep secret. And there are times for us when it feels like God is silent, like he's choosing not to share information with us. My experience has been that those times are for our good because in the searching, we find God. Sometimes in the direct knowing, we actually just let it pass by us. Okay, got that piece of information, now I can keep moving on. Really, the thing that is the most important about this, because uh, 
just like all the other things in Revelation, there's a lot of debate about what this secret um, thundering voices could have been saying. But here's the really important part, the, the part that we need to take away, is that we need to accept when God is silent. We need to accept that sometimes he doesn't want to give us all of the information because it's actually not good for us. It would actually be better for us if we kept see seeking, asking, knocking, keep praying, lean into the silence. We as, we as a society, we actually don't like silence. Mm -hmm. we, we don't like silence so much that my son will watch a movie while playing on his uh, Switch and he's got like a, a, a YouTube video playing in his ear at the same time. That's how much we don't like silence. I actually did something one time where it was, I was doing a sermon up here and it was on the power of pause. And I actually paused for like 30 seconds on stage, silently. And this started to happen. <laughs> People were like, okay, are we... You, Are we still you, here? They're you, fidgeting. They're like checking their watches. How long is she going to do this? And it's really telling. We don't like silence. So this, this is one of those areas where people want to get in there and they want to figure out the mystery. And, and it's really about accepting God's sovereignty and accepting his silence in our lives. Because when God is silent... Most often it's for our benefit or it's because we've got too much other noise that we have to get rid of first. Okay, continuing on with the thundering voices and the oath sworn. So we've had these thundering voices. John is not allowed to tell us what those voices say, even though he wanted to write it down. And now this angel, this messenger, swears an oath to God by raising his right hand which is the technical aspect of the solemn vow. It's the action of raising his hand toward the, heaven, the, the heavens that indicates the angel acknowledges and accepts God's sovereignty because that's where God dwells. And when the angel takes his oath, there are three things that happen. He declares God's eternal existing. He says, the one who lives forever and ever. He affirms God's role as creator. He says, who created the heavens and everything in them, the earth and everything in it, and the sea and everything in it. And he confirms that there will be no more delay. This initiates the last plagues that will begin with the final trumpet sounding. And in this little tiny box um, to the side on the picture, there's this commentary I found. And it was so comforting to me. It said, when the judgments are about to overwhelm us, God sends a messenger. When the world feels like it's crashing down around us, there is no greater comfort than to experience our victorious Savior's presence. That is beautiful. So the mysterious plan of God will unfold as the final overthrow of evil and the establishment of God's eternal kingdom is put into place. Now that term mysterious plan. It's kind of curious that that word mysterious is right there. And that's because it's from the original word. The original word was mysterion, which is a Greek word. And uh, we've lost some of that, the meaning and connotation in the original Greek when we translate it to English as mysterious. Because we're mysterious, like, ooh, mysterious. <laughs> yeah. No, that's not what it meant. It meant that which was previously unknown is now revealed. <laughs> and that's consistent with Revelation. That's exactly what we're digging into. Is you know the, the, how is this whole thing going to come to an end? Well, that is that is what 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 God is ultimately revealing. This is His final judgment. This is Him reconciling all of creation back to Himself. This is Him answering all the prayers that were stored up. And people are going, you know, why 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 did God why did all those bad things happen for all those years and the people who did injustice and they didn't get served justice and you know, why, why is that right? Why did God wait so long? You know, all those things. You know, that which was previously not known is now about to be revealed. This is the full revelation of God, which also invokes 
the um, fulfillment of God's kingdom being restored and restored back into creation in the earth, right? You have to unmake creation and restore God's kingdom and usher in the, 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 the millennial kingdom forever. So that's the, the rest of the fulfillment. Okay. Moving on, Revelation 10, we're going through verses 8 to 11 now. Then the voice from heaven spoke to me again, go and take the open scroll from the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the, the small scroll. Yes, take it and eat it, he said. It will be as sweet as honey in your mouth, but it will turn sour in your stomach. So I took the small scroll from the hand of the angel and I ate it. It was sweet in my mouth. When I swallowed it, it turned sour in my stomach. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. See, at this point now, John's um, being allowed to deal with this small scroll, with this little book. The voice from heaven tells him to take it from the angel and to eat it. And the results parallel the bittersweet experience that is to come. The joy representing God and his word would be accompanied by the overwhelming shock and sorrow related to the coming judgments. God's word is often compared to the sweetness of honey because of the pleasure it brings to our hearts. The sour stomach that follows should be a demonstration of the proper response to God's judgment. We have sweet anticipation of, of God's glory and our victory, but the bitterness is seeing God's wrath poured out on those who reject his son. We would be wrong to not be in sorrow over what's coming. We would be wrong to not feel it eating away at our heart. And God wants us to have that bittersweet feeling because we know the beauty, the joy, the pleasure, the honey of God's word. And we also know every one of us knows people who may never get to enjoy that. As modern believers, we should rejoice in God's righteousness, but we cannot forget to meditate on the terrible consequences for a rebellious humanity. And that may bring to mind somebody for you. That may bring to mind a situation. It may bring to mind people that you know or, or a circle of friends that you're a part of and, and your heart should ache if they don't know Jesus. It should. And our desire is God's desire is that we would then be able to share the wonderful things that he's done in our lives and hopefully they will choose Jesus as their savior as well so not only is the description of the scroll and how it is processed by John you know a a um, message for dealing with what's going on in Revelation and the judgment of the world. But, you know, God is also invoking additional meaning here. You know, eating the scroll, eating God's word, you know, that is an allusion to other parts of Scripture. I mean, that's what's incredible about Revelation is that, mo that most of its content is referring to existing Scripture and e expanding on it and explaining it. This scripture is, you know, we're not meant to live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God, right? That is God's word. We're supposed to live on God's word. And, and that is equipping us with the ability to handle what's coming and understand what's coming in Revelation. So as, as we digest the consequences of the situation, as we, un, as we, as we really come to terms with that judgment that's happening, how is it that we're supposed to um, uh, accept it, absorb it? Uh, how is it that we're supposed to understand why God is doing this? 
Well, by digesting his word. What does that mean? It means we have to study it. It means we have to know it. We are, we are told that we're meant to be equipped with the word. Because in so doing, we understand God's plan. It's, it, he's telling us what he's done, and he's telling us why he's doing it, and the information's already there. And so by taking it in, meditating on it, we can understand those other things that are happening. Yeah, the, the, the Jewish people of this time, they, they talked about the word of God, that they didn't just read the word of God, they ate the word of God. That, that was that terminology, and it meant that they chewed on it, they talked about it, they discussed it. It, it, it was constant that they were looking into reading, thinking. Um, I heard a great sermon um, just a couple of weeks ago, I found it, and it was on reading the Word of God. And, and this was a pastor, and he was saying, you know, I, I love those, you know, one, the Bible in a year reading programs. Those are great. That, that's wonderful. And if you haven't ever read the Bible, cool, do that. And then start somewhere and read a couple of lines, a couple of verses, and really think about every single word. Because every word in the Word of God is an important word. It's there for a reason. And so when, the, when John is taking and eating the word of God, it's you're being able to chew on it, meditate on it, really understand the meat of it, the juice of it, the, the taste of it, the smell of it. All of that comes into play. And, and this was a concept that rabbis talked about during the time um, where, where uh, Jesus walked the earth. Yes. Yeah. Yep. It does. Yep. Yep. <laughs> oh, please, oh, please, can you? Sure. And then I have an answer too. Sure. But yeah. Um, and we'll see. We'll see if our answers are the same. You never know. <laughs> Who goes first? Go first. Um, you said, please, oh, please, can I? <laughs> so, the, you know, the question is, what's the right version of the Bible? I mean, I mean I'm, I'm kind of distilling it down. You know, every word is important. You're like, well, well which version? Because the words aren't the same, depending on which version that you look in. Um, and the answer is, um, it depends. And the answer is, yes. And the answer is, no. Okay. <laughs> Um, now, now, there, done, move on. Okay. All right, so what... Don't what, worry, he'll, he'll do explain each one of those answers. Right. <laughs> um, and, and one of my favorite versions of, of, the, uh, of the Bible is uh, the expanded version. What does that mean? Basically, it reads like a thesaurus. <laughs> I like reading the thesaurus. I'm bizarre. Uh, what, can you, what can I tell you? I'm the, the son of a librarian. Um, so the reason it depends <laughs> is uh, because none of us speak or read Greek, Hebrew, or Aramaic, Aramaic that, I, that I know of. These are um, languages that are not in our context and, and not relevant to us. Um, there may be some people who um, speak Hebrew, but you know, uh, Greek and it's definitely Aramaic, um, it's ancient Greek and Aramaic, those are essentially dead languages. Um, but those were the languages that the, the Bible was originally recorded in. And so there are aspects of God's word, especially when we get into the Old Testament, where there's you know poetry and verse and mm -hmm. rhythm and numbers and the words, you know when you counted the letters and added them together, they you know invoked numero not yep. numerology that's the wrong word, uh, number symbolism that was very very 
um, significant to the Hebrews. They love playing around with numbers and words and languages. Yeah, they're an alphanumeric language. Yeah, and, and, and those numbers have meaning. You know, like seven is a godly number, and 12 has significance, and 24 is a doubling, and two is cool, too. And, <laughs> you know, like there's all that stuff, and that meaning is there. And we had a, a gentleman who um, came here for, for years, and he would do these pages and hand them out, and, and he would color code them, and it, he would go to the original uh, Hebrew letters and numbers for a single verse. And one single verse, he'd unpack it in a whole page, exploring the numbers and the cross-references and all that stuff. That, that is meditating on the word and digesting the word and getting into the detail. And those layers of meaning and significance, um, they're there, and God put them there. And so to, to really say, you know, every word of God matters means that, you know, really we do owe it to go back to the original language. Well, given that we don't speak Aramaic or uh, ancient Greek or, or Hebrew, how do we do that? We get out our strongs. We get out our multiple versions. I mean, in our house, we, we stock on the shelves a rotation <laughs> of... Yeah, NASB, CSV, uh, NIV, New King James. I don't have an original King James. Um, ESV, ESV, NLT. NLT the all, message. All these different. Uh, actually, the message is actually really powerful sometimes because you know it, it's that take home message. What's what what the pack the punch? And I and I would argue that even every word in the message is significant because it's helping to unpack and understand meaning that isn't necessarily conveyed in just the words. And so we can we can get to the significance of every word that was in the original language that the scriptures were recorded in by looking at multiple translations. And so you know, having a Bible reading plan, Bible in a year is fantastic. Having a Bible study plan where you dig in in, in detail is fantastic. Having a Bible memorization plan is critical. That's how you know we live on every word that comes out of the mouth of, of God by memorizing. We're, we're equipping ourselves with the full armor of God by memorizing the word so that we can face the enemies. You know, that's, that's significant. You know, the, getting into Ephesians and, and uh, equipping yourself with the full armor of God, there's significance to each one. And one of the big ones is memorizing God's word because that means you have the tools that it takes to deal with the attacks of, of the enemy. And what, is that, what does that mean? It means in your one-year Bible reading plan, do one in the NIV. And then the next year, do the CSB. And the next year, do the NASB. And the next year, do the King James. And the next year, do... Why? So that you are washing yourself and your mind and your heart in all those different versions so that you get the nuance and the meaning and the significance and you don't have to sit there and read the thesaurus as fun as that is in order to get all the connotations and things that are being implied by a certain word or a certain language that you you would not get if you just read and stuck to one version okay so that that's my long-winded answer to <laughs> you know which version yes <laughs> Um, the only thing I would add to that, well, actually, a couple things that I would add to that, because that's that's absolutely perfect, um, is first, start with one that you can read. Start with one that you can understand the words and, and read that. God is going to speak to you as you read his word, no matter which version you read it in. So start with one that you can read. So if, 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 you, if you love the King James, I, I grew up with the King James, my friends, and if, if that one speaks to you and you can understand that these, those, and all that, cool, do Easy. it, my friend. And if the NLT, because it's you know, written in pretty everyday plain language, speaks to you and you can read it, start there. God will speak to you through his word no matter which version you're using. And if you really want to dig into it, the other one I would recommend for you specifically is the Amplified Bible. Oh, that's what you're I love the Amplified Bible. That's the source. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so it's, it's basically um, laying out the verse, and then when there's a word that has all these different connotations in the original language, it, it will give you all the different meanings right there in line. It's not one of the, the versions where you can just read through it and it kind of makes sense. But if you really want to get in and dig into original connotation, do that. 
Another one, um, th this, this is going to be my next one. It's called the Tree of Life version. Okay, this is the one that's made for um, those who are Messianic Jews, meaning they have original Jewish heritage, and they want to um, really see how, uh, how the original uh, Old Testament in that language really connects to um, the, the prophetic coming of the Messiah and then his second coming. And so it, it really adds in a lot of the original Hebrew context and, um, and language. So that's going to be my next one because I love digging into this kind of stuff. Um, but ultimately, start with one you can read and God is going to speak to you. Yeah, Tony. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, because I, I yeah, all right, go ahead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and you've got to be careful about that. And so you may want to kind of get into what Tony is saying now and get back to the fact that if you go and tell him and speak to your heart, if you're reading through the Bible, if you're able to comprehend and get what it is that you're reading, then you're in the right congregation. And there's one thing that is so beautiful about the new technology. When you pray that way and you're going into Yeah. Translations right there from your iPhone or your pad or your Bible computer Hub. Yeah. And just go through all of it and then digest it that way. There's a particular verse that speaks to me. And you realize that there are lots of different ways that you can tell that verse and allow the Spirit to speak to your heart. And the great thing is about the technology and how it's working is you can tell it. When I put together a sermon, I do that all the time. Yeah. I will come across a record. Different mm -hmm. interpretations to make sure that I'm spot on. Because before I teach on something, I want to make sure that this is not my interpretation, that I'm really finding out what the heart of the God is that I'm trying to get. And keep in mind the translations are on a spectrum. Okay, what is that spectrum? On one end of the spectrum, you have adherence to the original language. Okay, so what that means is almost a word-for-word word on the extreme end of the spectrum is a word-for-word word translation where you're substituting the original word for word in English. And with the consequence of that, there's, there's, there's two consequences. One, you can wind up with some funky grammar because they leave the words largely in the same order and with only minor rearrangements in order to make it readable. Um, but it's probably the closest to the way it was recorded in the original language, right? And on the other end of the spectrum, you have readability and con conveying the message that is meant behind that entire verse. And so, you know, on, to, to equate that to specific translations, um, the NASB, New American Standard, okay, um, it is on the further end of the spectrum towards a word-for-word -word translation. And I like it because of that very specific meaning and translation of specific words. And a lot of times you have to go look them up. You're like, what, I, I, what is that word? What does that mean? You got to go look it up. I love that. What, do I, what can I say? I'm weird. I'm the son of a librarian. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, extreme end of the spectrum, is the message. And they're like, to heck with the original words. Let's record the meaning and convey the meaning. So it's a, it's a spectrum. And so when Heather says, pick one that you can read, sometimes you gotta start with the one that you, know, you don't worry about the fancy language and the specific words, and you just, you're just, it's just about the message, which is why there's a translation called just the message, right? And then as you study it and you dig into it and you learn more, you'll gravitate more to it and you ultimately land at the Amplified, which is like reading the source. 
if you get really extreme about it, you start to learn the original he Hebrew and Greek, and you go get those dictionaries <laughs> out. You translate it yourself. Yep. That's incredible. You read it, you're read you reading paper, papers, and you're like, what translation is this? And the author will actually put in there, my translation, meaning they went and looked up the original language and figured out each word and translated it. And like, I think it really needs to say it this way in, in order to really capture the essence of what's going on. So... Yeah. What a question, by the way. I love it. Yeah. Maria. There, there is so much um, difference in reading and understanding uh, from a Jewish context and a Jewish culture. Um, not only a, a modern-day Jewish context and culture, but an original Jewish context and culture. Um, and if that's something that you really want to dig into, I, that is just a blessing to my heart. Um, and there are lots of resources out there in order to help get to that original context, culture, and understanding. Um, and all of that, all of this to say, if you're digging in more, and you're digging in further, and you're looking to digest the word of God, not just read it, then you're already headed in the right direction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You, you, and you have to go back to the, the language of the day. What did that language be, mean? And, and you're right. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not murder. Those are, those are actually two different things because the people, the Jewish people, they killed other people. 
So really, what are you trying to understand? So the, the whole point with this is, yes, dig in. Seek the word of God. Read different translations. Uh, get an amplified version if you'd love to, to know the full connotation. Get a tree of life version if you want to understand more of the Jewish original heritage and, and culture and context. The point is, keep digging. The point is, keep looking. Keep pulling in new studies, keep exploring the word of God. I mean, it's why we're even here. It's why we're even in Revelation is, is to explore the word of God in a new, a different way. Good. Okay, that was a great tangent, um, and I loved it. And um, because you can see Christopher and I are like, woo, let's have this conversation. Um, and now let's get back. <laughs> Uh, so we're back to John and the edible scroll. He's told that he's got to continue to prophesy for believers. And he's got to warn men about the bitter judgment that is coming with the seventh trumpet. So we're going to continue on into this next section of, of, of the prophetic vision that he's been given. Revelation concerns the future of the entire world. So John is going to prophesy about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. So now we're going to pick up in Revelation 11, verses just 1 and 2. Revelation 11, 1 and 2. Then I was given a measuring stick, and I was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the number of worshipers. But do not measure the outer courtyard, for it has been turned over to the nations. They will trample the holy city for 42 months. Now, the interpretation of chapter 11 is debated. It's disputed, mu like much of Revelation. Uh, many take the description of the temple to be symbolic for the church as, as, as a whole, the church in general. But there are some very, very specific details that are mentioned in connection with the temple, the altar, the court which is outside the temple, the holy city, and the oppression from the Gentile nations. And it makes that interpretation um, unlikely. The building of the tribulational temple will be one of the signs of the last days and may be the same one um, that Ezekiel places in the millennium. It's from Ezekiel 40 through 48. Do you have something? Sean had a question. Oh, yeah. Correct. Correct. Yeah. We're actually in the second half of the tribulation. All of that happened in the first half, the first three and a half years. Now we're in the second half. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, but the, yes, but the reading of Revelation, um, there is some overlap and parallelism that goes on. So yes, it is in order. Yes, it is in sequence, uh, but some of the chapters are, um, you're, you get like a, a preview and, or you get like an overview of what's happening, and then it'll dig in and give um, detail of what's going on. And so we're about to get into, you know, the beast and what is that and who is it and how does he work and what's he doing, right? Um, and that's the Antichrist. And so, you know, what I was going to say about this temple in the tribulation temple. You're like, wait, okay, which temple is that, right? Well, which, which, it's God's temple, so that means it's the temple of the Jews, and that also means where is it, and also when is it, because there's been multiple temples over time, and which one is it, because there isn't a temple standing today, and where is it, because there isn't a temple standing today. And so um, this is, in, in, we just saw at the end of chapter 10, and John will prophecy, right? So this right here is, is a lot of people interpret this as a prophecy, meaning that under the reign of the beast, under the reign of the Antichrist, he's going to be such a sweet talker and reach so many people that he is going to make it possible mm -hmm. and arrange for there to be a temple built. Where? In the Holy Land. Well, in the Holy Land right now, 
there's a temple for the Muslims standing right where it should be. So there's this interpretation that the two temples are going to be you know, right next to each other, and that's going to be, it's going to sound great, and people are going to love it. And it's one of the reasons that everybody loves the beast, everybody loves the Antichrist, everybody who's in the world, is because he made it possible for there to be this peace, he made it possible for there to be this accord, for people to be able to share the Holy Land. And yet, you know, yes, it is God's temple, and he is going to be worshipped there, but it doesn't stand today, and when we see a temple being built in the Holy Land right next to that, the, the place of worship of the Muslims, we're looking at prophecy being fulfilled because it doesn't stand there today. So is that literal? Maybe. Is it prophetic? Yes, because this is a book of prophecy. Uh, is it going to literally look like that? God only knows. And, and, and this is, there's, like Christopher said, there are some things that are overlapping. And, and in this instance, John has seen like three things that are happening all at the same time. Um, there's sort of an overlap here, what's happening in heaven, what's happening on earth, that kind of thing. But the understanding is, yeah, the three and a half years of the, the first half of the tribulation, where we had earthquakes quakes and fires and meteor showers and comets and destruction and all of that, that has already happened. And we're now in the second half. That was a great question. Um, <clears throat> John is, uh, is given this hollow reed, um, and this is something that would have been indigenous to the southern area of Israel. It would have grown in the Jordan River, and he was given it to measure the temple and to count all of the worshipers. And um, this was something that was used. It was, it was light, but it was rigid. So they used this as a measuring stick in the, in the time. So this, this would have made sense. Like, we don't, we don't use a, a reed, <laughs> a hollow reed, to measure anything, right? We use a very precise ruler and, you know, now digital scan thing that tells me how far away that wall is and, um, and, and all of that. So you... This is bringing back that, that original context um, is that would have made perfect sense to them because they used that as a measuring stick. Um, and then he's given this to measure the building, and he's only allowed to measure the holy place and the holy of holies, um, not the court of the Gentiles. So the court of the Gentiles, I'll actually show you a picture on the next one. Um, this kind of shows you where how the, the temple was set up, um, and the court of the Gentiles was... Um, outside of the temple area. And um, what this is looking at is that, that uh, during this time, what's going to dominate Israel um, during the last half of the tribulation is these non-God-loving people, those who are, um, to the core, rebellious. They will have control of it. Uh, and then there's the measuring of the human populace. So this is the worshipers. Um, and this is, it's a little bit um, enigmatic here. That's a little bit uh, unknown. And it may refer to a spiritual checkup. That's one of the interpretations uh, for those who are, um, who have converted, who actually believe at this point. Um, it's sort of a checkup on, on where they are. Go measure uh, those who are uh, professing faith. So the court of the Gentiles it was outside. It was separate from the inner court because Gentiles, non-Jewish people, were forbidden to enter the inner court on penalty of death. Now, the symbolism indicates that God is rejecting the unbelieving Gentiles. Now, all that means is those who are not Christians. So there were Jews, there were Gentiles at this time, but there were these, these, are, not, the, these are not Gentiles as in all non-Jewish people. It's non-believing Gentiles. So those who are not Christians, who have oppressed God's people. And then there's a specific number that is called out here, that it's 42 months. And that helps us confirm, because 42 months is three and a half years, and that this is the second half of the tribulation. 
So you'll see that number pop up over and over and over again, but you have these other numbers. It's kind of, kind of to Sean's question and point, you know, is this stuff sequential? Is it actually in chronological order? Because sometimes it's 1,260, 1,280, 1,260 days. Sometimes it's three and a half years. Sometimes it's uh, 42 months. That is all a reference to the same amount of time. And which number is used probably goes back to that number significance in the original language. But all of it is consistent, and it's actually also consistent with prophecy. If you go back to the book of Daniel, Daniel talks about how in the end times there's going to be, and a lot of, a lot of, a lot of um, uh, translations will uh, translate it as a week, but it wasn't actually a week. It was a heptad, a group of seven. And what's a group of seven? It's a week, right? I mean, so, so there's a, a misinterpretation that it's just a week. And it's all, but it's a metaphorical week, so it's seven years. It's like, yes, he was referring to a grouping of seven being the seven years. And there's a first half and there's a second half. So three and a half years and three and a half years is seven. That's your grouping of seven, which is four, uh, two sets of 42 months and also two sets of 1,260 days. 60 days. So. Okay. Ready to keep going? We right. are Revelation 11, 3 through 6. You got that? And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will be clothed in burlap, and will prophesy during those 1260 days. And other versions will say sackcloth. Burlap, sackcloth. Instead of burlap. These two prophets are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of all the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire flashes from their mouths and consumes their enemies. This is how anyone who tries to harm them must die. They have power to shut the sky so that no rain will fall for as long as they prophesy. And they have the power to turn the rivers and oceans into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they wish. Okay, so John now sees two witnesses ministering for a period of 42 months, 1260 days, three and a half years. And these two individuals are granted very special and specific power and authority by God. And their purpose is to preach the message of both judgment and salvation. So the judgment that's coming, but the mercy of God through salvation in Jesus Christ. There's, there's actually a parallel here to the Old Testament um, because in the Old Testament, you required um, two or more witnesses that were uh, required to confirm any testimony. So not just even one witness, you had to have two. So, so God is um, paralleling back to the word that he has already given to his people in the Old Testament. So during the time of their witnessing, um, they will be invincible. Like we, we see, you know, comic books and, and Marvel movies, and they, they seem invincible. No. They, they aren't invincible, but these two will be absolutely 100% invincible for the time that they are, that they are uh, witnessing to the world. And if anyone tries to harm them, fire and flames are going to issue from the mouths and consume their enemies. They cannot be killed in this three and a half uh, year time period. And the two prophets will be the culmination of God's testimony to Israel. That will be a message of judgment from God and of his gracious offer to the of the gospel to all who repent and believe. So it says they're dressed in sackcloth or burlap. And they wore those, um, and, and there's a lot of symbolic meaning there. Um, sackcloth or burlap was symbolic for mourning. That's what you would wear in a period of mourning. And these two witnesses will be mourning for the sins of the world. Um, it would have been made of goat or camel hair, so really not nice and soft. Um, very, very rough to the skin. Uh, and traditionally, it also represented or expressed penitence and humility in addition to mourning. So the two of them, they're called the olive trees, two olive trees and two lampstands. And what that brings us back to is two other witnesses that come from Zechariah 4.11, and they are uh, associated with another literal uh, rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity. Um, the reason that they're talking about olive oil, um, this is one of the interpretations, the commentaries, is that olive oil was a common fuel source for lamps. So they're both the... the 
they're consuming, the, the fire consumes the oil in the lampstands, the two of them um, will spread the light of God um, and of God's word in the power of the spirit as the two lampstands full of the olive oil and on fire for spreading the gospel message. So there's a little bit of debate about who these two are. And um, a lot of commentators believe that the two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. And it's because there's a lot of parallels. There's a lot of um, commonality there. Like Moses, um, they will be given the power to strike the earth with plagues. And like Elijah, they will have the power to keep it from raining. Now, Jewish tradition uh, expected both Moses and Elijah to return in the future. And in fact, Moses and Elijah came and they were there at, um, at the transfiguration. They were present at the transfiguration. And that is in uh, Matthew 17, Mark 9, Luke 9. And it says, Elijah was taken up into heaven. And that God says he buried Moses' body where nobody would find it. Interesting, also an additional parallel in why people think this is going to be the return of Moses and Elijah is that the length of the drought um, will be three and a half years, which is the same as that brought on by Elijah. So some interesting parallels. Will it be Moses and Elijah? I don't know, but God does. Okay, let's keep going. We are in Revelation 11, 7 through 14. It says... When they complete their testimony, so the two witnesses, when the two witnesses complete their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the bottomless pit will declare war against them, and he will conquer them and kill them, and their bodies will lie in the main street of Jerusalem, the city that is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, the city where the Lord was, their Lord was crucified, and for three and a half days, which is interesting because it parallels the three and a half years, all peoples, tribes, languages, and nations will stare at their bodies. No one will be allowed to bury them. All the people who belong to this world will gloat over them and give presents to each other to celebrate the death of the two prophets that tormented them. But after three and a half days, God breathed life into them and they stood up. Terror struck all who were staring at them. Then a loud voice from heaven called to the two prophets, come up here, and they rose to heaven in a cloud as their enemies watched. At the same time, there was a terrible earthquake that destroyed a tenth of the city. 7,000 people died in that earthquake, and everyone else was terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second terror is past, but look, the third terror is coming. So this is where the two witnesses are martyred. And what's really important is the first line, when they have finished their testimony. That is absolutely crucial to this chapter. Because these are the faithful witnesses, and they would be, have been kept, by, kept from harm um, until their service was fully complete. And the sinners would hear from God one more time. And only then... After their witness, uh, and they had finished their testimony, after it was complete, that's when the beast, the Antichrist, will be able to kill them. And up until that point, they will be invincible. And that kind of feels very bleak. Uh, and it probably um, would have felt uh, like, like the end of faith for John in that moment. Uh, because these are the, the, the two witnesses that are going to create an additional conversion. And uh, the, this is the point where their bodies are left in the streets and people celebrate their death. Um, the people who were celebrating didn't want to hear the message of judgment. Like, we, we, we really don't like that message. Salvation, yeah, we're cool with that one. But we actually don't really like the message of judgment. So they even died, the two witnesses, the decency of burial. They weren't even allowed to be buried for those three and a half days. And then there's this figurative reference to the city of Jerusalem as Sodom and Egypt. And the reason that it's called Sodom and Egypt is because it depicts the utter depravity that the city has fallen into. This very once faithful city is now so far from the Lord, so far from the Lord, that it's referenced as Sodom or Egypt. 
And, you know, there's something that struck me. It's, it's absolutely ironic. It's sheer irony that here, the only earthy, earthly celebration on the earth, this is when it breaks out, when God's two witnesses are killed. Two thousand years ago, how did you cross a large body of water? Boat. boat. What kind of boat? Sailboat. sailboat. How fast is a sailboat? Yeah, a little slower than the wind. Two thousand years ago, how did you cross large bodies of land? On foot, or if you're lucky, on camel or horseback or wagon back, but you walked at the speed of walking, whether it was a person walking, an animal walking. 200 years ago, how did you cross large bodies of water? On a boat. How fast? Speed of wind. How did you cross large bodies of land? You walked. So, how long did it take for news to travel? As long as it took for a boat, a boat to traverse, a or a person to walk, right? So there's something. This is prophecy. This is this is prophecy, and it says here. This wouldn't have made sense for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. This would not have made sense. It says, all the people who belong to this world will gloat over them and give presents to each other to celebrate the death of the two prophets who had tormented them. How long are they dead? How long are they in the street? Three and a half days. Three and a half days. Those literal days? Seems like it. Because when he meant three and a half years, he said three and a half years. When he says three and a half days, he says three and a half days. So for thousands of years of human history where news traveled at the speed of a floating boat blown by the wind or at the speed of walking, News would take months or years to reach all the people of the world. So how, in three and a half days of these bodies starting to rot, can all the people all over the world see it? Whatever the media is that will be present at this time, will make it possible for all the world to see this essentially in real time. And, and that's also how you know it's not right now, because there are still people in this world without access to that kind of technology. Sorry. And it would still take days or months to get information. But we're not there yet. Yeah, so how, but how close are we? But we're really darn Closer close. than we've ever been. Closer than we've ever been. And that really means something, because look at how the speed of information has accelerated over the last 100 years, 10 years, 2 years? How long will it take before everyone has instantaneous access to all information? The interweb <laughs> is pretty amazing. And it's in the Bible. <laughs> 2,000 years ago. Okay, so what John sees next um, would be a source of rejo rejoicing for the righteous. God breathed life into the dead witnesses. He strikes fear, he says terror, into their killers, into their murderers. And the message will be absolutely clear to the world. God is the Almighty. They've been out in the street under 24-hour video feed. They probably don't smell awesome. The decay is real. And yet God, after three and a half days, breathes life into them. There is no mistaking that. It says all of the people are going to see it. That means all of the people are going to see that God is almighty and powerful. God avenges their death and their mistreatment, that and he causes an earthquake that kills 7,000 people. 
But here's something amazing. Remember I said these, these were going to be some bittersweet chapters? That's the bitter. Here's the sweet. Following this, the remainder of the people would give glory to God because they recognized his power. Now that most likely, the way that this is worded, it most likely refers to a legitimate, although localized, conversion of people who were previously antagonistic or against Christ. So there's a few things that I want us as modern day believers to take away from this. Very important things. First, no believer, no believer will be taken from the earth before God's purposes for them is complete. Second, those who suffer will be satisfied by God's righteous punishment of their tormentors. And the third is that God's mercy is so great as to break through to some of the most hardened souls, those who celebrated giving each other presents because the two witnesses were killed. And for three and a half days, they celebrated. And God breathes life, and everybody sees it. Every, the, God's word is clear here. Everybody sees it. And God's power, his almighty power, is absolutely understood. He's still evangelizing at this point. I, what, do, what do we know? One of my favorite verses, Genesis 50, 20, that which the enemy would use for evil, God will use for good. So here we have you know, his two witnesses, right? They've been successful for three and a half years, have been invincible. They die. Peter's like, no, right? That's evil. That's, you know, and the enemy will use that. Victory, right? And we know there's the people who are left on the earth are so excited, they make it a holiday, the death of the two witnesses, it's a holiday. They give each other presents, right? That's what you do on holidays. They've made this into a holiday. They've made it like Christmas. God's messengers are dead. We didn't want to hear it. Yay! And God says, it's okay. That which the enemy meant for evil, I will use for good. And he shocks them, and he breathes life. Yahweh, Maria, Yahweh, he breathes life back into the two that were dead. Why three and a half days? Because there's no arguing after three and a half days of death that the death is there, right? That's in the Bible too. That's, that's actually at the resurrection of, oh, why did I just blank on the guy's name? Lazarus. Uh, Lazarus, the re re resurrection of Lazarus. I actually talk about that in the Bible. Words are in there. Yep. There's going to be a you smell. You don't smell good. It's not going to smell good, <laughs> smell of death. There's no mistaking that smell for anything else, and it's going to be on Lazarus. I don't want to open up the tomb. That's why three days, three and a half days. There's no arguing with it being a miracle after death and decay is literally reversed at the, at the will of God. That's why. It's just amazing. God is still evangelizing to the world. He's not done bringing anyone who will turn to him, giving them a chance to turn to him. It's amazing. And, and, and he's going to use this, this amazing moment to create a mass conversion. I love um, Romans 11, 25, 26 says this. And when you read this in light of Revelation, there is just something amazing that, that can happen in your heart. I want you to understand this mystery, dear brothers and sisters, so that you will not feel proud about yourselves. Some of the people of Israel have hard hearts, but this will last only until the full number full number of Gentiles come to, comes to Christ, and so all Israel will be saved. Read that in light of Revelation. Why does he wait so long? It says right there, it was a mystery. Mm -hmm. Why does he wait so long? So the full so number the full of Gentiles. Number. Who's the Gentiles? It's you. It's me. We're not Jewish. Well, maybe some of you are, but I'm not, right? There were the Jews and there was the Gentiles, the Jews and everybody else. So we're waiting for everybody else to have the full opportunity to come to saving faith. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. The last of chapter 11. Last of chapter 11, starting in verse 15. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices shouting in heaven. The world has now become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. 
The 24 elders sitting on their thrones before God fell with their faces to the ground and worshiped him. And they said, we give thanks to you, Lord God, the Almighty, the one who is and who always was. For now you have assumed your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were filled with wrath, but now the time of your wrath has come. It is time to judge the dead and reward your servants, the prophets, as well as your holy people and all who fear your name. From the least to the greatest, it is time to destroy all who have caused destruction on the earth. Then in heaven, the temple of God was opened, and the ark of his covenant could be seen inside the temple. Lightning flashed, thunder crashed and roared, and there was an earthquake and a terrible hailstorm. So from this verse on, John is brought to the cusp of the second coming of Christ. And for the first time in Revelation, there are plural voices that are heard. And this is announcing the transition of power. The seventh trumpet, remember we talked last time about the seventh of everything leads into the first of the next. The seventh trumpet contains the bowl judgments. And it, along with them, it terminates at the second coming. So now we're gonna now we're gonna start to look at the kingdom. The visible rule of the earth would soon take place through the co-regency, the co-rule of the Father and his anointed one, the one we know as the Lord Jesus. The long rebellion of the world, which suffers Satan's influence, will end with the victorious return of Jesus, of Christ. And he will defeat his enemies and establish the messianic kingdom. And I love this. The words forever and ever indicate that this is a permanent change. It's a permanent change. And one of the things that is really important here is that it says he's begun. He's begun to reign. So this is now the transition. So John now once again sees those 24 elders in heaven as they lay face down in worship and they give thanks because he has begun to reign. Remember, just, just a couple of verses ago, um, there, there was the angel that says there will be no more delay. Here it comes. Here it comes. Brought judgment on the nations that have raged against him and they praise God for rewarding his servants and for bringing justice for them. And then we see the temple in heaven. So the open heavenly temple indicates that faithful Jewish believers will have access to God despite the adverse circumstances of the tribulation period. There, this is the heavenly version of the Holy of Holies where God dwells in his glory. And John had see, previously seen the throne and the altar, and now he sees even more in heaven. He sees the Holy of Holies, and he sees the Ark of the Covenant. He sees the Ark of God. It's a symbol of forgiveness, and it is going to assure their redemption. So first century believers may have taken similar comfort from this vision. The vision of the Ark of the Covenant, it, it symbolized God's presence in the Old Testament, God was on the mercy seat of the ark. The earthly ark was only a picture of what this one is going to be. The ark is where God provides mercy and atonement for sin. And there's a wonderful parallel here that I think it's important to see. When the veil was torn at Christ's death on the cross, the earthly holy of holies was open. And now, the Holy of Holies in heaven is opened. And God is coming forth with his new covenant, with a redeeming purpose in the midst of judgment. And after the temple is opened, the lightning, thunder, and there's earthquakes and hail, it all su suggests God's power in judgment on earth. And specifically, the lightning and the thunder suggest God's presence. We're going back into 
Revelation 4, 5 there. Did you have something you wanted to add? It just, um, you know, when you go back to the Pentateuch, you know, the first five books of the Bible, um, you know, you have the, um, the tabernacle, right, the tent of meeting. And uh, it is so, so specific. The instructions that are given for the construction uh, of the tabernacle are just so, so specific, right? And then when you get to the building of the temple, right? So when, when uh, Solomon was able to use his inheritance from his father, biggest inheritance ever given to, to a son, and he's able to use it and he builds the temple, the instructions are so, so specific, heavenly instructions are so specific about exactly how things are to be made, the, the, the weight of each material, the dimensions of every piece. It's like, why? Why is it so specific? Why, is, why, do we, why do we spend so many words recording those very specific things? It's because this is a representation of God's actual throne in heaven. Why? So his people will recognize. So when we see this, when we see the throne in heaven, the people who are God's people and who have studied, and we're like, I know that. I recognize that. This is God's mercy seat. This is, this is God's covenant, right? And so covenant, covenant, covenant. What is covenant? Covenant is a promise. God has been promising for thousands of years to make his people one with him, be one with him, be in his presence, to be with them, figuratively, li literally, that we would be sustained, right, through these covenants. And so this imagery of the covenant, the mercy seat, ark of the covenant, the throne, the promise, all of that, it just reiterates and, and punches home fulfillment of God's promise. That even though we're living in this fallen world, that, that parts of it are going to reject him and be judged and be sit, sit separate from him for all eternity in, in judgment and torment, what he's trying to do is make it so that everyone who wants to be with him can get to him. Okay, so let's go talk about what I want you to do for this week. So uh, just, does anybody have favorite scriptures? Just hands up. Do you have favorite scriptures that you love? Christopher talked about one of his, that what the, the enemy intends for evil, that the Lord will use it for good. I want you to think about your favorite scriptures, scriptures that, that bring joy to your heart or, or ones that, uh, that really, um, really speak to you. And there's a couple that I put in here, Lamentations, um, it's 5, 22, 23, it says, the faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. Faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. And then another one, Zephaniah three seventeen, for the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. Those are great. So here's what I want you to do. Pick one of your favorites, or you can use one of the ones that I, that I just put here, uh, and read the whole chapter that it sits in. And you might be surprised that there is something bitter along with the sweet. So this week, take time Eat the word of God, chew on it, savor it, feel the meat, feel the juice. See God's sweetness that includes his justice and how that truth can help you face disappointments and hardships that come from living in a fallen world. And then if you would like to, read 12 and 13 because that's we're gonna, what we're going to look at next. Actually, 12, 13, and 14. Um, 12 through 14 is next week. Do you have any last thing you want to add? 
Yeah, uh, actually, what Carl just added. So, you know, you're asking for favorite verses, yeah. and Carl on the back says Psalm 91. So I don't know why. I mean, people are, are uh, you know, shouting things out. I just happen to turn to Psalm 91, and it illustrates this point perfectly. Mm-hmm. Okay? So I'm not going to read the whole thing, but Psalm 91. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Man, it's just paralleling with everything we're talking about, armor. and Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrow that flies in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, though ten thousand are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. Sweet, bitter. It's both there. Just exactly parallels what we're looking at in Revelation. So thank you for that, Carl. (laughs) Sean? No, no, it's a really good question. No, it's okay. I I like this spot. (laughs) We have lights and everything. Um, Do you want to start? And then I'll add into it. So for those who can't hear on on the recording, Sean is asking about the apparent contradiction with um, Jesus and what he said in, you know, the the, uh, letters, the epistles, the synoptic gospels um, about the day of the Lord being like a thief in the night coming and you're not going to know when it is and only the, only the Father knows the day, not even the Son knows the day. And then we've got Revelation where you have these very specific, recognizable, hallmark, um, what, would you, what would you call those? Uh, uh, milestones, events that, that mark specific time frames where things are going to happen. So is it, is it going to be sudden and unforeseen and 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 happen suddenly when and come on us when we're unawares or are you gonna be like yep there's the beginning of the first three and a half years and you know okay um so that apparent contradiction is one of my favorites it's um and why because when you dig in you find god you find uh, about some incredible truth wisdom Um, nature uh, of God that was unknown to you before. The concept of apparent contradictions has a specific name. It's called antinomy. Uh, um, What that means is ante, meaning opposing, and nomi is actually, nomiol is referring to laws. So two things that are truth, two things that are law, two things that are absolutely, you know, irrefutable, and they seem to be against each other and point against each other. And that's one of God's mysteries in how he resolves that. You're like, how can it be this and this? Those things are an apparent contradiction. And God goes, I resolve contradiction. 
that when you when you really dig into it and find out what it is, um, you'll find out some incredible truth and in, about the nature uh, of God and and His I infinite power, wisdom, creation, uh, love, kindness, intelligence, all those things. And so, an antinomy. Um, and so, this is where where do we find antinomy? <laughs> In bump verses, remember we were talking about bump verses? I love bump verses where you're reading along, and you're like, I don't know what that means. You just kind of bump over it and keep going, going down the road. And Revelation, the whole thing of Revelation is like a bump verse. It's a bump chapter. It's a bump book because people were going, how do, you, how, how do you reconcile this, right? And when you dig into it, what do you find? Incredible truth and nature of God revealed. So I love digging into antinomy. Um, some of them, some of them, um, will be revealed in time that we, that we don't understand today. Like we actually talked about one today, or just earlier tonight about communication. How is it that every person on the earth could see something happening contemporaneously at the same instant, right? For thousands of years, how many people who were studying the word in Revelation, and we know they were. We know Revelation was one of the most preached books for the first three centuries of Christianity. They really dug into it. They're reading this going, how is every person in the world going to see this thing at the same time? It takes us years to find out that our king died, and we've been living without a king, and the new king took over. We didn't, when didn't that happen three years ago? We didn't know that. We were still swearing to King George or whatever, right? <laughs> Right? We did not know that King George was dead because a boat hadn't floated across the pond yet to tell us, right? How, how, to those people, how would it make sense that everybody alive is seeing something at the same time? What an amazing revelation that we have instantaneous communication today. Even today, you're like, well, but there's you know tribes in the jungle that don't have the internet and electronics. How are they going to find out about it? I don't know. Maybe it's going to be like in sci-fi where there's a screen projected across this entire sky where everybody looks up and sees it. I can't conceive of that today, but is the technology in a few years going to be there? Probably. What are we going to say? Wi-Fi from the sky. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. It's, it's uh, closer we are, we today are, than we have ever been, right? Yeah, go ahead, and okay. then I had something to add. All right, so to Sean's point, Sean's question, how is it possible that it's going to be like a thief in the night, and yet there's going to be these signs and these, these milestones, okay? How do, you, how do you reconcile that, Okay. Um, for, you know, we, we talked about there being the birth pangs, you know, these, these pre-echoes of what's to come. We're seeing them now. We're feeling them now. Okay? So it's already not going to be a surprise. Okay? But there's people who are going to see the signs and disregard them for what yes. they are. Oh, I have more time. Oh, I have more time. Oh, I have more time. Or they just don't okay? believe. Or they just don't believe or they don't care. All right? So it's, it's going to be a surprise for everyone when it really starts, right? And when it really starts, there's going to be people who be like, man, these earthquakes are really bad. What's going on with global warming causing earthquakes or something? I don't know, right? And there's people who are just going to be like, blinders, I'm not seeing it. And there's other people who are going to be like, these are the signs. Seven days starts from now. They're both wrong, right? When is that day? When are these hallmarks? It's on God's calendar, and he's told us what the day, days are. So when we start hearing trumpets, now you, can, now you can really mark a timeline, okay? When we start hearing trumpets in the sky that, that blow over the entire world, all right, that, we could probably put a pin in that day. That day hasn't come yet. Will it be tomorrow? I don't know. There's been enough pangs that I'm wondering if, you know, how close are we? We have Wi-Fi in the sky. We have incredible connectivity. We have all these, all these things that are happening, right? There isn't, a, there isn't a, a temple in in Jerusalem next to, what was that, the Mount of the Rock or whatever it's called? Yeah, it's not there yet. So how long does it take to build a temple? I don't know. Construction's getting pretty quick, though. So how do you reconcile that? God only knows, right? But some of it is going to be in perspectives, and some of it is going to be in um, technology and the nature of people that 
they choose not to see, they choose not to recognize, or they haven't been given the opportunity yet. What are you going to uh, you, you sort of went to a place that I was going to go to specifically about, you know, Jesus is going to come like a thief in the night. What is a thief in the night that, that you don't know it's coming? Who doesn't know that it's coming? Those who don't believe. Or those who haven't heard. Or those who haven't heard. Absolutely. Will it feel like their world is being taken away from them? Yeah. Will it feel like when the day of judgment comes, everything is being ripped apart for them because they don't believe? Yeah, it will. So it will be like a thief in the night, just not to us. And, and you're right to say, you know, Jesus could come back tomorrow. Well, well, God could do anything, but he has told us that he's going to get all of us out of here first, and then Jesus is going to come back seven years later. And all these things have to happen. Why do all these things have to happen? Because God wants to reconcile as many people to himself as he can. Why did he use the, the death of two witnesses who for three and a half years were preaching his name? Because at the end of it, when he raises them from the dead, so many more people will believe. That's the point. And also, I mean, let's, let's look at, let's, the only other thing I would add to that is that Jesus was speaking to the people of his day in a way that they could understand, and they didn't have the book of Revelation. Ooh. Good point. Oh. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> Thank you for the really good question. Okay. I don't know if it's completely satisfying, but it's it it, it kind of gets you there. Not to not to get rid of their oppressors. Yep. Yeah, they thought he was coming as a warrior. Yeah. No, nope, I, I, I definitely hear what you're saying, and um, it's, it's the reason that we're here, and um, there's a reason from the very beginning I've said I'm going to give you guys the most widely understood and accepted interpretations, but I'm very honest when I say there are lots of different interpretations. So we're going to go with the one that we understand the best, but this is prophetic vision. I'm telling you, they didn't understand what, when, when God said that, you know, um, that he, that she was going to uh, give birth and, and it was through her seed that the world would be saved and, and she, that he would strike his heel and, and, and yet he would hit him on the head, right? This is the original prophecy about Jesus. So what does that mean? Well, it only makes sense when the events actually unfold. And then you look back. Which I'm going to share with you something a little bit about myself, a little bit of my walk of faith and my testimony, some of the things that I really struggled with. Um, you know, I was a, a, an atheist and kind of a jerk about it for uh, a significant portion of my life. Um, and one of the reasons that I was an atheist is because, um, it, as Heather helped me to come to understand, um, I had a, um, like a Sunday school teacher that... Um, you know, gave me an answer that made sense to them but didn't make sense to me. And, you know, when I was looking for evidence, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a scientist, I'm a chemist, I'm a biochemist, you know, I'm analytical. Um, I need evidence. You know, I'm, I'm very 
logical, methodical, how I, I build up a case for, you know, something being the truth, something being the evidence. And I've been like that for my whole life. Yeah, a parent volunteer. Yeah, to be fair, so there's parent volunteer. So a Sunday school teacher to how old is that? Eight, you know, to the eight year old. It's just a parent volunteer. You're know, doing the best they can, trying to share faith. And I asked, you know, why? It was, it was, I was always asking why. Why do we believe that? Why should I have? Why should I, you know, take take these stories at, at face value and believe this? And uh, I got scolded that. Um, you know, our, our place is not to question why, it's to just believe. Ooh, blind faith, blind faith. Why, why should I accept something that there isn't evidence for, right? And um, that combined with some other things of being cynical and thinking that I was smarter than everybody else, um, which is why I was kind of mean about being an atheist, um, led me to turn away from organized religion and faith in general. And uh, I, I, I lived by that for a long, long time, long time, until God hit me with a, a clue by four, which is it's my testimony how I came to faith. It was that um, you know, I saw him working in our lives, uh, and I didn't recognize it. I was like, okay, this was not a mistake. Um, there was, you know, God, didn't call it God at the time, but, you know, there's, there was a, a, a string of events that couldn't have been coincidence, and it was for the good of an orphan. And I was like, I see God's fingerprints in that, and that's tough because I don't believe in God, <laughs> you know. Like, so wh where am I going with this? There's a verse that people either find huge comfort in, or it leads them to like reject faith for a significant portion of their life. It's in Hebrews 11:1. 1. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see, or the faith of things unseen. Right? And I just, I just bristled at that years, because it's blind faith. How can you have faith in something that you haven't, you can't see? If you can't see it, you can't measure it, if you can't taste it, if you can't touch it, how can you be expected to believe in it? And what I've come to in, as the interpretation of that is um, a lot of times you, you can't understand something until you see it in hindsight, until you, you look back on it, you know, uh, hindsight's twenty twenty, and and that's the evidence that we have. When you go back and look at prophecies, you know Genesis one, Pentateuch. You know Moses teaching the Bible when there was no Bible, right? It was the scriptures. And there's this prophecy in Genesis about you know the, how God is going to de defeat sin, and they're looking at that and they're going how, and then we look back on it and go, oh Jesus, you know, you know how 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 much later? 1,500 years later, right? No, 3,500 years. That was 3,500 3, B.C. was, was uh, Moses. So after 3,500 years before the Jews had the opportunity to see how what appears to be a crushing defeat of salvation, the death of Jesus, was actually God's masterstroke to defeat sin and death, right? So in hindsight, you go, oh, and what is that? That's, that allows us to look at prophecy and antinomy and apparent contradictions and go, how can that possibly be? It doesn't make sense. I don't see how. I don't see. But you can still have faith that God will work out those things that you can't see. How? By looking back at his progressive revelation through all of the scriptures. He's revealed more and more and more about himself and how he works in his people and in his creation. And things that, what's the whole point of prophecy? So that you could see and know and believe, right? So he tells, this is what I'm going to do. You know, I don't see how. And then he does it and you're like, oh. So he's done it over and over and over for thousands of years. He said, this is what I'm going to do. And then he does it. And you look back and you're like, now I see it. And it lets you have faith in those things that you can't see going forward. So, to your point, how can it be a thief in the night and it be broadcast loud and clear? Uh, I'm not sure, but I have faith that he's going to do it in a way that's really cool and that I didn't see coming because I'm not creative like God. <laughs> yeah. How are we doing?
It is 749. We're doing well. Okay. Well, why don't we pray? And uh, and then we'll, we'll head out. Heavenly Father, uh, your word is like honey. It is sweet to the taste. But Lord, we live in a fallen world, and so there is always bitterness. Lord, help your word be a comfort to us. Open our hearts, our minds to the wisdom that you would like to reveal to us. And we studied tonight, and we know you don't always give us all the information. And that's for our good and for your glory. So God, I pray as we think this week through our favorite verses, as we think this week about what we've read, talked about, and really dug into tonight, that you would remind us that your word is not just a one-time sentence, a one-time chapter, a one-time book, a one-time Bible. It is a living, breathing word. And each time we dig into it, we will get to understand something more about you. Let that wisdom, let the Spirit give us more and more wisdom about your word. I thank you, Lord, for each person who was here tonight. I thank you, God, for the way we can we can dig in, we can discuss, we can question. Because our goal is always, Lord, to know you more and to know you better. So help us to do that. Help us each time that we sit down, that we read your word, that we come together and we talk about it, that our hearts would be open to what you would like to speak to us in that moment. I know, God, that I have read your word over and over and over again and over and over and over again. You've given me something new. I thank you, Lord. You are the one who is, who always was, and who always will be. You are the creator of all things, God. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much. And uh, we will be here next week. We will have uh, chapters 12, 13, and 14. So we will go through all three next week.